Chapter Twelve of the Czar's Spy by William Lecoeur. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Strangler. Where was Alma? What was the cause of her inexplicable disappearance into the gloomy forest while we had slept? I returned to the hotel where I had stayed on my arrival, a comfortable place called the Phoenix, and lunched there alone. Both Felix, the Finn, and my host, the woodcutter, had received their douceur and left, but to the last named I had given instructions to return home at once and report by telegraph any news of my lost one. A thousand conflicting thoughts rose within me as I sat in that crowded salle à manger filled with a goblin crowd of the commercial men of Abo. I had, I recognized, now to deal with the most powerful man in the country, and I suffered a distinct advantage by being in ignorance of the reason he held that sweet English girl a prisoner. The tragedy of the dastardly manner in which she had been willfully maimed caused my blood to boil within me. I had never believed that in this civilized twentieth century such things could be. Michael Baranski had given his pledge to assist me, yet he had most plainly explained to me his fears. The Baron was intent upon again getting Elma into his power. Was it at his orders, I wondered, that the sweet-faced girl had been deprived of speech and hearing? Had she fallen an innocent victim to his infamous scheming? About me men were eating strange dishes and talking in Finnish, while others were smoking and drinking their vodka but I was in no mood for observation. My only thought was of she who was now lost to me. Why had she disappeared without warning? I was at a loss to imagine, yet I could only surmise that her flight had been compulsory. Some women possess a mysterious sense of intuition, a curious and indescribable faculty of knowing when evil threatens them, that presents a strange and puzzling problem to our scientists. It is unaccountable, and yet many women possess it in a very marked degree. Was it therefore possible that Elma had awakened, and being warned of her peril had fled without arousing us? The suggestion was possible, but I feared improbable. Another very curious feature in the affair was the sudden manner in which Michael Baranski had exerted his power and influence in order to render me that service. He had actually bribed the guards of Kayana, he had instructed the faithful Felix, he had provided our boat, and he had ordered the nun to open the water gate to me. Why? There was, I felt convinced, some hidden motive in all that sudden and marked friendliness. That he really hated the English I had seen plainly when we had first met and I had only compelled him to serve me by presenting the order signed by the Emperor which made me his guest within the Russian dominions. Even that document did not account for the length he had gone to secure the release of the woman I now loved in secret. The more I thought it over, the more anxious did I become. I could discern no motive for his friendliness, and truth to tell, I always distrust those who are too friendly. What straight and decided line of action should I take? Carefully, I went over all the strange events that had happened in England, and while anxious to obtain some solution of the amazing problem, yet I could not bring myself to leave Finland and allow Elma to fall into the clutches of that high official who so persistently sought her end. No, I would go to him and face him. I was anxious to see what manner of man was the strangler of Finland. Therefore, that same evening I left Abo, and travelled by rail up to the junction at Toyala, where after a wait of six hours I resumed a slow journey to Helsingfors. I put up at Camps, an elegant hotel on the long esplanade overlooking the port, and found the town, with its handsome streets and spacious squares, to be a much finer place than I had believed. When I inquired of the French director of my hotel for the residence of His Excellency the Governor-General, he regarded me with some surprise, saying, "'The Baron lives up at the palace, monsieur, that great building opposite the Salutong. The driver of your drosky will point it out to you.' 
"'Is His Excellency in Helsingfors at the present moment?' I asked. "'The Baron never leaves the palace, monsieur,' responded the man. "'This is a strange country, you know,' he added with a grin. "'It is said that His Excellency is in hourly fear of assassination.' "'Perhaps not without cause,' I remarked in a low voice, at which he elevated his shoulders and smiled. At noon I descended from a drosky before the low, grey, massive building, over the big doorway of which was a large escutcheon bearing the Russian arms emblazoned in gold, and on entering where a sentry stood on either side, a colossal concierge in livery of bright blue and gold came forward to meet me, asking in Russian, "'Whom do you wish to see?' "'His Excellency the Governor-General.' "'Have you an appointment?' "'No.' His Excellency sees no one without an appointment, the man told me somewhat gruffly. I am not here on public business, but upon a private matter, I explained. Perhaps I may see His Excellency's secretary? If you wish, but I repeat that His Excellency sees no one without a previous appointment. I knew this quite well, for the Strangler of Finland, fearful of assassination, was as unapproachable as the Tsar himself. Following the directions of the concierge, however, I crossed a great bare courtyard, and ascending a wide stone staircase, was confronted by a servant who, on hearing my inquiry, took me into a waiting-room and left with my card to Colonel Lugansky, whom he informed me was the baron's private secretary. After ten minutes or so the man returned, saying, "'The colonel will see you if you will please step this way.' and following him he conducted me into the richly furnished private apartments of the palace, across a great hall filled with fine paintings, and then up a long, thickly carpeted passage to a small, elegant room where a tall, bald-headed man in military uniform stood awaiting me. "'Your name is Monsieur Gregg,' he exclaimed in very good French and I understand you desire audience of His Excellency, the Governor-General. I regret, however, that he never gives audience to strangers. The matter upon which I desire to see His Excellency is of a purely private and confidential nature, I said. For used as I was to the ways of foreign officialdom, I spoke with the same firm courtesy as himself. I am very sorry, monsieur, but I fear it will be necessary in that case for you to write to His Excellency and mark your letter personal. It will then go into the Governor-General's own hands. What I have to say cannot be committed to writing, was my reply. I must see Baron Oberg upon a matter which affects him personally, and which admits of no delay. He glanced at me quickly, and then in a low voice inquired, is it in regard to a, well, a conspiracy? His question instantly suggested to me a ruse, and I replied in the affirmative. Then you can place the facts before me without the slightest hesitation, he said, going to the door and slipping the bolt into its socket. Anything spoken into my ears is as though it were spoken into that of His Excellency himself. I much regret, Monsieur the Colonel, that I must see the Baron in person. Has the plot assassination as its object, or revolt? he asked pointedly. That I will explain to the Baron only. But I tell you, he will not see you. We have so many persons here with secret information concerning Finnish conspiracies against our Russian rule. Why, if His Excellency saw every one who desired to see him, he would be compelled to give audience the whole twenty-four hours round. At a glance I saw that this elegant colonel, who seemed to take the greatest pride over his exquisitely kept person and his spotless uniform, did not intend to allow me the satisfaction of an audience of that most hated official of the Tsar. The latter was in fear of the dagger, the pistol, or the bomb, and consequently hedged himself in by persons of the colonel's type, courteous, diplomatic, but utterly unbending. After some further argument, I said at last in a firm tone, 
I wish to impress upon you the extreme importance of the information I have to impart, and can only repeat that it is a matter concerning His Excellency privately. Will you therefore do me the favour to take my name to him? His Excellency refuses to be troubled with the names of strangers, was his cold reply, as he turned over my card in his hand. But if I write upon it the nature of my business, and enclose it in an envelope, will you then take it to him? I suggested. He hesitated for a short time, twisting his moustache, and then replied with great reluctance, Well, if you are so determined, you may write your business upon your card. I therefore took out one, and on the back wrote in French the words which I knew must have the effect of obtaining an audience for me. To give information regarding Miss Elma Heath. This I enclosed in the envelope he handed to me, when ringing a bell he handed it to the footman, who appeared with orders to take it to His Excellency and await a reply. The response came in a few minutes. His Excellency will give audience to the English monsieur. Then I rose and followed the footman through several wide corridors filled with palms and flowers, which formed a kind of winter garden, until we crossed a red-carpeted ante-room where two statuesque sentries stood on guard, and the man conducting me rapped at the great polished mahogany doors of the room beyond. A voice responded. The door was opened, and I found myself in a high, beautifully painted room, with long windows hung with pastel blue silk with heavy gilt fringe, a pastel blue carpet, and upon the opposite wall a great canopy of rich purple velvet bearing the double-headed eagle embroidered in gold. The apartment was splendidly decorated, and in the centre of the parquet floor, with his back to the light, was the thin, wiry figure of an elderly man in a funereal frock-coat, in the lapel of which showed the red and yellow ribbon of the Order of St. Anne. His hands were behind his back, and he stood purposely in such a position that when I entered I could not at first see his face against the strong grey light behind. But when the footman had bowed and retired, and we were alone, he turned slightly, and I then saw that his bony face with high cheekbones, slight grey side-whiskers, hard mouth and black eyes set closely together, was one that bore the mark of evil upon it, the keen, sinister countenance of one who could act without any compunction and without regret. Truly one would not be surprised at any cruel, dastardly action of a man with such a face, the face of an oppressor. Well, he snapped in French in a high-pitched voice. You want to see me concerning that mad English girl? What picturesque lies do you intend to tell me concerning her? I have no intention of telling any untruths concerning her, was my quick response, as I faced him unflinchingly. She has told me sufficient to— She has told you something? Ah, I guessed as much. I expected this and I saw that his thin, crafty face went pale, while his eyes glanced evilly upon me. He believed that she had revealed to me her secret. He placed his hand upon the back of a chair wherein was concealed an electric button, and the next instant a little stout man in shabby black appeared as though by magic through a secret door hidden in the dark panel of the audience chamber. The man who was his personal guard against the plots for his assassination. His Excellency spoke, and the words he uttered staggered me. I stood aghast. Seize that man, he cried, pointing to me. He is armed. He has just threatened to kill me. He is the man against whom we were recently warned, the Englishman. Ah, I cried, standing before the thin-faced official of the Tsar, the unscrupulous man who had crushed Finland beneath the iron heel of Russia, and who, by his lying allegation, now held me in his power. I see your object, Baron Oberg. You intend to arrest me as a conspirator. Search the fellow. He has a revolver there in his hip pocket, declared the Governor-General, and in an instant the short, ferret-eyed little man had run his hands down me and felt my weapon. I drew it forth and handed it to him, saying, 
you are quite welcome to it if you fear that i am here with any sinister motive he obtained admission by a clever ruse the baron explained to the police agent and then he threatened me it's untrue i protested hotly i have merely called to see you regarding the young english lady elma heath the unfortunate lady whom you consigned to the fortress of kayana the mad woman you mean he laughed she is not mad i cried but as sane as you yourself it is you who intended that the horrors of the castle should drive her insane and thus your secret should be kept what do you suggest he demanded stepping a few paces towards me i mean xavier oberg that you would kill elma heath if you dared to do so i answered plainly as i faced him unflinchingly you see he laughed turning to the stout man at my side the fellow is insane he does not know what he is talking about ah my dear malkoff i've had a narrow escape he came here intending to shoot me i did not i protested i am here to demand satisfaction on behalf of miss heath oh well if the lady cares to come here herself i will give her the satisfaction she desires was his crafty reply the lady has escaped you and it is therefore hardly likely she will willingly return to helsingfors i said it was you who succeeded by throwing the guard into the water in abducting her from the castle he remarked but he added sneeringly with a sinister smile i presume your gallantry was prompted by affection eh that is my own affair a deaf and dumb woman is surely not a very cheerful companion and who caused her that affliction i cried hotly when she was at chichester she possessed speech and hearing as other girls do indeed she was not afflicted when on board the lola in leghorn harbour only a few months ago perhaps you recollect the narrow escape the yacht had on the meloria sands his eyes met mine and i saw by his drawn face and narrow brows that my words were causing him the utmost consternation my object was to make him believe that i knew more than i really did to hold him in fear in fact perhaps the man whom some know as hornby or woodruff could tell an interesting story i went on he will no doubt when he meets elma heath and finds the terrible affliction of which she has been the victim his thin bony countenance was bloodless his mouth twitched and his grey brows contracted quickly uh, i haven't the least idea what you mean my dear sir he stammered all that you say is entirely enigmatical to me what have i to do with this mad englishwoman's affairs send out this man i said pointing to the detective malakoff who had appeared from behind the panelling of the audience chamber send him out and i will tell you but the representative of the czar always as much in dread of assassination as his imperial master refused i saw that what i had said had upset him and that he was not at all clear as to how much or how little of the true facts i knew the connection between the little miniature cross of the order of st anne and that red and yellow ribbon in his buttonhole struck me forcibly at that moment and i said i have no desire to make any statements before a second person i came here to see you privately and in private i will speak i have certain information that will i feel confident be of the utmost interest to you concerning another woman amida santini his lips were pressed together and i noticed how he started when i uttered the name of that woman whom i had found dead in rannoch wood and whose body had so mysteriously disappeared and what on earth can the woman concern me he asked with a brave attempt to remain cool still speaking in french only that you know her was my brief reply then with my eyes still fixed upon his i asked will you not now request this gentleman to retire he hesitated a moment and then with a wave of his hand dismissed the man he had summoned to his aid a moment later the strangler's personal protector had disappeared through the secret door in the panel by which he had entered 
"'Well?' asked the baron, turning quickly to me again, his dark, evil eyes trying to fathom my intentions. "'Well?' I asked. "'And what, pray, can you profit by denouncing me as an assassin? "'Remember, Baron, that your secret is mine,' I said in a clear voice, full of meaning. "'And your intention is blackmail, eh?' he snapped, walking to the window and back again. "'How much do you want?' "'My intention is nothing of the kind. "'My object is to avenge the outrageous injury to Elma Heath.' "'Of course, that is only natural, monsieur, if you have fallen in love with her,' he said. "'But are not your intentions somewhat ill-advised, considering her position as a criminal lunatic?' "'She is neither,' I protested quickly. "'Very well. You know better than myself,' he laughed. "'The offence for which she was condemned to confinement in a fortress was the attempted assassination of Madame Vakurov, wife of the general commanding the Uleaborg military division. Assassination, I cried. Have you actually sent her to prison as a murderess? I have not. The criminal court of Abo did so, he said dryly. The offence has since been proved to have been the outcome of a political conspiracy, and the minister of the interior in Petersburg last week signed an order for the prisoner's transportation to the Isle of Sakhalyan. Ah, I remarked with set teeth, because you fear that she shall write down your secret. You are insulting. You evidently do not know what you are saying, he exclaimed resentfully. I know what I am saying quite well. You have requested her removal to Sakhalyan in order that the truth may never be known. But, Baron Oberg, I added with mock politeness, you may do as you will, and you may send Elma Heath to her grave. You may hold me prisoner if you dare, but there are still witnesses of your crime that will rise against you. In an instant he went ghastly pale, and I knew that my blind shot had struck its mark. The man before me was guilty of some crime, but what it was only Elma herself could tell. That he had had her arrested for an attempted political assassination only showed how ingeniously and craftily the heartless ruler of that ruined country had laid his plans. He feared Elva, and therefore had conspired to have her sent out to that dismal penal island in the far-off Pacific. "'You do not fear arrest, monsieur?' he asked, as though with some surprise. "'Not in the least. At least, not arrest by you. You may be the representative of the emperor in Finland, but even here there is justice for the innocent.' A sinister smile played around the thin grey lips of the man whose very name was hated throughout the great empire of the Tsar, and was synonymous of oppression, injustice, and heartless tyranny. "'All I can repeat,' he said, "'is that if you bring the young Englishwoman here, I shall be quite prepared to hear her appeal.' And he laughed harshly. "'You ask that because you know it is impossible,' I said whereat he again laughed in my face, a laugh which made me wonder whether Elma had not already fallen into his hands. The uncertainty of her fate held me in terrible suspense. I merely wish to impress upon you the fact that I have not the slightest interest whatsoever in the person in question, he said coldly. You seem to have formed some romantic attachment towards this young woman who attempted to poison Madame Vakurov, and who have succeeded in rescuing her from Kayana. You afterwards disregard the fact that you are liable to a long term of imprisonment yourself, and actually have the audacity to seek audience of me, and make all sorts of hints and suggestions that I have held the woman a prisoner for my own ends? Not only do I repeat that, Baron Oberg, I said quickly, but I also allege that it was at your instigation that in Siena an operation was performed upon the unfortunate girl which deprived her of speech and hearing. At my instigation? Yes, at yours. He laughed again, but uneasily, a forced laugh, and leaned against the edge of the big writing-table near the window. Well, what next? he inquired pretending to be interested in my allegations. What do you want of me? I desire you to give the Mademoiselle Heath her complete freedom, I said. 
Is that all? All for the present. But her future is not in my hands. The minister in Petersburg has decreed her removal to Sakhalien as a person dangerous to the state. Which means that she will be ill-treated, knouted to death, perhaps? We do not use the knout in the Russian prisons nowadays, he said briefly. His Majesty has decreed its abolition. But you adopt torture in Kayana and Schusselburg instead. My time is too limited to discuss our penal system, monsieur, he exclaimed impatiently, while I could well see that he was anxious to escape before I made any further charges against him. I had already showed him that Elma had spoken, and he feared that she had told the truth. While this would embitter him against her and cause him to seek to silence her at all hazards, it was of course in my own interests that he should fear any revelations I might make. You have posed in England as the uncle of Elma Heath, and yet you here hold her prisoner. For what reason? I demanded. She is held prisoner by the state for conspiracy against Russian rule, not by herself personally. Who enticed her here? Why, you yourself. Who conspired to throw the guilt of this attempted murder of the general's wife upon her? You, you, the man whom they call the Strangler of Finland. But I will avenge the cruel and abominable affliction you have placed upon her. Her secret, your secret, Baron Oberg, shall be published to the world. You are her enemy, and therefore mine. Very well, he growled between his teeth, advancing towards me threateningly, his fists clenched in his rage. Recollect, monsieur, that you have insulted me. Recollect that I am Governor-General of Finland. If you were Tsar himself, I should not hesitate to denounce you as the tyrant and mutilator of a poor, defenceless woman. And to whom, pray, will you tell this romantic story of yours? He laughed hoarsely. To your prison walls below the lake at Kayana? Yes, Monsieur Gregg, you will go there, and once within the fortress you shall never again see the light of day. You threaten me, the Governor-General of Finland? He laughed in a strange high-pitched key as he threw himself into a chair and scribbled something rapidly upon paper, appending his signature in his small, crabbed handwriting. I do not threaten, I said in open defiance. I shall act. And so shall I, he said with an evil grin upon his bony face as he blotted what he had written and took it up, adding, In the darkness and silence of your living tomb you can tell whatever strange stories you like concerning me. They are used to idiots where you are going, he added grimly. Oh, and where am I going? Back to Kayana. This order consigns you to confinement there as a dangerous political conspirator, as one who has threatened me. It consigns you to the cells below the lake for life. I laughed aloud, and my hand sought my wallet, wherein was that all-powerful document, the order of the emperor which gave me, as an imperial guest, immunity from arrest. I would produce it as my trump card. Next second, however, I held my breath, and I think I must have turned pale. My pocket was empty. My wallet had been stolen. Entirely and helplessly, I had fallen into the hands of the tyrant of the Tsar. His own personal interest would be to consign me to a living tomb in that grim fortress of Kayana, the horrors of which were unspeakable. I had seen enough during my inspection of the Russian prisons as a journalist to know that there, in strangled Finland, I should not be treated with the same consideration or humanity as in Petersburg or Warsaw. The Governor-General consigned me to Kayana as a political, which was synonymous with a sentence of death in those damp, dark oubliettes below the water dungeons every whit as awful as those of the Paris Bastille. We faced each other, and I looked straight into his grey bony face and answered in a tone of defiance, You are Governor-General, it is true, but you will, I think, reflect before you consign me, an Englishman, to prison without trial. I know full well that the English are hated by Russia, 
yet i assure you that in london we entertain no love for your nation or its methods yes he laughed you are quite right russia has no use for an effete ally such as england is effete or powerful my country is still able to present an ultimatum when diplomacy requires it i said therefore i have no fear send me to prison and i tell you that the responsibility rests upon yourself and folding my arms i kept my eyes intently upon his so that he should not see that i wavered as for the responsibility i certainly do not fear that monsieur he said but the exposure that will result are you prepared to face that i asked perhaps you are not aware that others beside myself one other indeed who is a diplomatist is aware of my journey here if i do not return your ministry of foreign affairs in petersburg will be pressed for a reason which they will not give then if they do not the truth will be out i said laughing harshly for i saw how determined he had become to hold me prisoner come call up your myrmidon and send me to kayana it will be the first step towards your own downfall we shall see he growled ah you surely do not think that i after ten years service in the british diplomatic service would dare to come to finland upon this quest would dare to face the rotten and corrupt officialdom which russia has placed within this country without first taking some adequate precaution no baron therefore i defy you and i leave helsingfors to-night you will not you are under arrest i laughed heartily and snapped my fingers saying before you give me over to your police first telegraph to your minister of finance monsieur de witte and inquire of him who and what i am i don't understand you you have merely to send my name and description to the minister and ask for a reply i said he will give you instructions or if you so desire ask his majesty yourself and why pray does his majesty concern himself about you he asked at once puzzled you will learn later after i am confined in kayana and your secret is known in petersburg what do you mean i mean i said i mean that i have taken all the necessary steps to be forearmed against you the day i am incarcerated by your order the whole truth will be known i shall not be the sufferer but you will my words purposely enigmatical misled him he saw the drift of my argument and being of course unaware of how much i knew he was still in fear of me my only uncertainty was of the actual fate of poor elma my wallet had been stolen with a purpose without a doubt for the thief had deprived me of that most important of all documents the open sesame to every closed door the ukase of the czar you defy me he said hoarsely turning back to the window with the written order for my imprisonment as a political still in his hand but we shall see you rule finland i said in a hard tone but you have no power over gordon gregg i have power and intend to exert it for your own ruin i remarked with a self-confident smile you may give your torturous orders to kill me orders that a fatal accident shall occur within the fortress but i tell you frankly that my death will neither erase nor conceal your own offences there are others away in england who are aware of them and who will in order to avenge my death speak the truth remember that although elma heath has been deprived of both hearing and of speech she can still write down the true facts in black and white the czar may be your patron and you his favourite but his majesty has no tolerance of officials who are guilty of what you are guilty of you talk of arresting me i added with a smile why you ought rather to go on your knees and beg my silence he went white with rage at my cutting sarcasm he literally boiled over for he saw that i was quite cool and had no fear of him or of the terrible punishment to which he intended to consign me besides which he was filled with wonder regarding the exact amount of information which elma had imparted to me there were certain persons i went on to whom it would be of intense interest to know the true reason why the steam yacht lola put into leghorn why i was entertained on board her 
why the safe in the British consulate was rifled, and why the unfortunate girl, kept a prisoner on board, was taken on shore just before the hurried sailing of the vessel. And there are other mysteries which the English police are trying to solve, namely the reason Armida Santini and a man disguised as her husband died in Scotland at the hand of an assassin. But surely I need say no more. It is surely sufficient to convince you that if the truth were spoken, the revelations would be distinctly awkward. For whom? he asked, opening his eyes. For you. Come, Baron, I said. Can we not speak frankly? But he was silent for a moment, a fact which was in itself proof that my pointed argument had caused him to reconsider his intention of sending me under escort back to that castle of terror. If my journey there was in order to meet my love, I would not have cared. It was the ignorance of her whereabouts, or of her fate, that held me in such deep, all-consuming anxiety. Each hour that passed increased my fond and tender affection for her. And yet what irony of circumstance! She had been cruelly snatched from me at the very moment that freedom had been ours. I think it was well that I assumed that air of defiance with the man who had ground Finland beneath his heel. He was unused to it. No one dared to go against his will, or to utter taunt or threat to him. He was paramount with all the powers of an emperor, the power indeed of life and death. Therefore he was not in the habit of being either thwarted or criticized, and I could see that my words had aroused within him a boiling tumult of resentment and of rage. I told him nothing of the loss of my wallet, or of the precious document that it had contained. My defiance was merely upon principle. Arrest me if you like, denounce me by means of any lie that arises to your lips, but remember that the truth is known beyond the confines of the Russian Empire, and for that reason traces will be sought of me and full explanation demanded. I have taken precautions, Xavier Oberg, I added, therefore do your worst. I repeat again that I defy you. He paced the room, his thin claw-like hand still clenched, his yellow teeth grinding, his dark deep-set eyes fixed straight before him. If he had dared, he would have struck me down at his feet. But he did not dare. I saw too plainly that even though my wallet was gone, I still held the trump card that he feared me. The mention I had made of the Minister of Finance, however, seemed to cause him considerable hesitation. That high official had the ear of the Emperor, and if I were a friend there might be inquiries. As I stood before him, leaning against a small buhl table, I watched all the complex workings of his mind, and tried to read the mysterious motive which had caused him to consign poor Elma to Kayana. He was a proud bully, possessing neither pity nor remorse, an average specimen of the high Russian official, a hide-bound bureaucrat, a slave to etiquette, and possessing a veneer of polish. But beneath it all I saw that he was a coward in deadly fear of assassination a coward who dreaded lest some secret should be revealed. That concealed door in the panelling with the armed guard lurking behind was sufficiently plain evidence that he was not the fearless Governor-General that was popularly supposed. He, the strangler of Finland, had crushed the gallant nation into submission, ruining their commerce, sapping the country by impressing its youth into the Russian army, forbidding the use of the Finnish language, and taxing the people until the factories had been compelled to close down while the peasantry starved. And now, on the verge of revolt, there had arisen a band of patriots who resented ruin, and who had already warned His Majesty by letter that if Baron Oberg were not removed from his post, he would die. These and other thoughts ran through my mind in the silence that followed our heated argument, for I saw well that he was in actual fear of me. I had led him to believe that I knew everything, and that his future was in my hands, while he, on his part, was anxious to hold me prisoner, and yet dared not do so. My wallet had probably been stolen by some lurking police spy, for Russian agents abound everywhere in Finland, reporting conspiracies that do not exist, and denouncing the innocent as politicals. 
The baron had halted and was looking through one of the great windows down upon the courtyard below where the sentries were pacing. The palace was for him a gilded prison, for he dared not go out for a drive in one or other of the parks, or for a blow on the water across to Hogholmen or Daguerro, being compelled to remain there for months without showing himself publicly. People in Abo had told me that when he did go out into the streets of Helsingfors it was at night, and he usually disguised himself in the uniform of a private soldier of the guard, thus escaping recognition by those who, driven to desperation by injustice, sought his life. A long silence had fallen between us, and it now occurred to me to take advantage of his hesitation. Therefore I said in a firm voice, in French, I think, Baron, our interview is at an end, is it not? Therefore I wish you good day. He turned upon me suddenly with an evil flash in his dark eyes and a snarling imprecation in Russian upon his lips. His hand still held the order committing me to the fortress. But before I leave, you will destroy that document. It may fall into other hands, you know, and I walked towards him with quick determination. I shall do nothing of the kind, he snapped. Without further word, I snatched the paper from his thin white fingers and tore it up before his face. His countenance went livid. I do not think I have ever seen a man's face assume such an expression of fiendish vindictiveness. It was as though at that instant hell had been let loose within his heart. But I turned upon my heel and went out, passing the sentries in the ante-room, along the flower-filled corridors, and across the courtyard to the main entrance where the gorgeous concierge saluted me as I stepped forth into the square. I had escaped by means of my own diplomacy and firmness. The Tsar's representative, the man who ruled that country, feared me, and for that reason did not hold me prisoner. Yet when I recalled that evil look of revenge upon my departure, I could not help certain feelings of grave apprehension arising within me. Returning to my hotel, I smoked a cigar in my room and pondered. Where was Elma? was the chief question which arose within my mind. But remaining in Helsingfors, I could achieve nothing further, now that I had made the acquaintance of the oppressor, whereas, if I returned to Abo, I might perchance be able to obtain some clue to my love's whereabouts. I call her my love, because I both pitied and loved the poor afflicted girl, who was so helpless and defenceless. Therefore I took the midnight train back to Abo, arriving at the hotel next morning. After an hour's rest I set out anxiously in search of Felix, the drosky driver. I found him in his log-built house in the Ludno quarter, and when he asked me in I saw from his face that he had news to impart. Well, I inquired, and what of the lady? Has she been found? Ah, your excellency, it is a pity you were not here yesterday, he said with a sigh. Why, tell me quickly, what has happened? I have been assisting the police as spy, excellency, as I often do, and I have seen her. Seen her? Where? I cried in quick anxiety. Here, in Abo, she arrived yesterday morning from Tamafors, accompanied by an Englishman. She had changed her dress and was all in black. They lunched together at the Restaurant du Nord, opposite the landing stage, and an hour later left by steamer for Petersburg. "'An Englishman!' I cried. "'Did you not inform the chief of police, Boransky?' "'Yes, Your Excellency. But he said that their passports being in order, it was better to allow the lady to proceed.' To delay her might mean her re-arrest in Finland, he added. Then their passports were visaed here on embarking, I exclaimed. What was the name upon that of the Englishman? I have it here written down, Excellency. I cannot pronounce your difficult English names. And he produced a scrap of dirty paper whereon was written in a Russian hand the name Martin Woodruff. End of chapter 12 
Chapter Thirteen of the Czar's Spy by William Lecoeur. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A double game and its consequences. I went to the railway station, and from the timetable gathered that if I left Abo by rail at noon, I could be in Petersburg an hour before noon on the morrow, or about four hours before the arrival of the steamer by which the silent girl and her companion were passengers. This I decided upon doing, but before leaving I paid a visit to my friend Boransky, who, to my surprise and delight, handed me my wallet with the Tsar's letter intact, saying that it had been found upon a German thief who had been arrested at the harbour on the previous night. The fellow had, no doubt, stolen it from my pocket, believing I carried my paper money in the flap. "'The affair of the English lady is a most extraordinary one,' remarked the chief of police, toying with his pen as he sat at his big table. "'She seems to have met this Englishman up at Tamafors, or at some place further north. Yet it is curious that her passport should be in order, even though she fled so precipitately from Kayana. There is a mystery connected with her disappearance from the woodcutter's hut that I confess I cannot fathom.' "'Neither can I,' I said. I know the man who is with her, and cannot help fearing that he is her bitterest enemy, that he is acting in concert with the baron. Then why is he taking her to the capital, beyond the jurisdiction of the governor-general? I am going straight to Petersburg to ascertain, I said. I have only come to thank you for your kindness in this matter. Truth to tell, I have been somewhat surprised that you should have interested yourself on my behalf, I added looking straight at the uniformed official. "'It was not on yours, but on hers,' he answered, somewhat enigmatically. "'I know something of the affair, but it was my duty as a man to help the poor girl to escape from that terrible place. She has, I know, been unjustly condemned for the attempted assassination of the wife of a general, condemned with a purpose, of course. Such a thing is not unusual in Finland.' "'Abominable!' I cried. Oberg is a veritable fiend. But the man only shrugged his shoulders, saying, The orders of His Excellency, the Governor-General, have to be obeyed whatever they are. We often regret, but we dare not refuse to carry them out. Russian rule is a disgrace to our modern civilization, I declared hotly. I have every sympathy with those who are fighting for freedom. Ah, you are not alone in that, he sighed, speaking in a low whisper, and glancing around. His Majesty would order reforms and ameliorate the condition of his people, if only it were possible. But he, like his officials, are powerless. Here we speak of the great uprising with bated breath, but we, alas, know that it must come one day, very soon, and Finland will be the first to endeavour to break her bonds, and the Baron Oberg the first to fall. For nearly an hour I sat with him, surprised to find how, although his exterior was so harsh and uncouth, yet his heart really bled for the poor starving people he was so constantly forced to oppress. "'I have ruined this town of Abo,' he declared quite frankly. "'To my own knowledge, five hundred innocent persons have gone to prison, and another two hundred have been exiled to Siberia.' Yet what I have done is only a direct orders from Helsingfors, orders that are stern, pitiless, and unjust. Men have been torn from their families and sent to the mines. Women have been arrested for no offence and shipped off to Sakalien, and mere children have been cast into prison on charges of political conspiracy with their elders, in order to russify the province. Only, he added anxiously, I trust you will never repeat what I tell you. You have asked me why I assisted the English mademoiselle to escape from Kayana, and I have explained the reason. We ate a hearty meal in company at the Sampalina, a restaurant built like a Swiss chalet, and at noon I entered the train on the first stage of my slow, tedious journey through the great silent forests and along the shores of the lakes of southern Finland by way of Tavistus and Viborg, to Petersburg. I was alone in the compartment, and sat moodily watching the panorama of wood and river 
as we slowly wound up the tortuous ascents and descended the steep gradients. I had not even a newspaper with which to while away the time, only my own apprehensive thoughts of whither my helpless love was being conducted. Surely to no man was there ever presented such a complicated problem as that which I was now trying so vigorously to solve. I loved Elma Heath. The more I reflected, the deeper did her sweet countenance and tender grace impress themselves upon my heart. I loved her, therefore I was striving to overtake her. The steamer, I learned, would call at Hango and Helsingfors. Would they, I wonder, disembark at either of those places? Was the man whom I had known as Hornby, the owner of the Lola, taking her to place her again in the fiendish hands of Xavier Oberg? The very thought of it caused me to hold my breath. Daylight came at last, cold and grey, over those dreary interminable marshes where game, especially snipe, seemed abundant, and at a small station at the head of a lake called Davidstadt, I took my morning glass of tea, then we resumed our journey down to Viborg, where a short, thick Russian of the commercial class, but something of a dandy, entered my compartment, and we left express for Petersburg. We had passed by a small station called Galitsina, near which were many villas occupied in summer by families from Petersburg, and were travelling through the dense, gloomy pine woods when my fellow traveller, having asked permission to smoke, commenced to chat affably. He seemed a pleasant fellow, and told me that he was a wool merchant, and that he had been having a pleasant vacation trout-fishing in the Vorsky, above the falls of the Imatra, where the pools between the rapids abounded with fish. He had told me that on account of the shore being so full of weeds, and the clearness of the water, fishing from the banks was almost an impossibility, and how they had to accustom themselves to troll from a boat so small as to only accommodate the rower and the fisherman. Then he remarked suddenly, "'You are English, I presume, possibly from Helsingfors?' "'No,' I answered, "'from Abo. I crossed from Stockholm, and am going to Petersburg.' "'And I also. I live in Petersburg,' he added. "'We may perhaps meet one day. Do you know the capital?' I explained that I had visited it once before, and had done the usual round of sightseeing. His manner was brisk and to the point, as became a man of business, but when we stopped at Bela Ostrov, on the opposite side of the small winding river that separates Finland from Russia proper, the customs officer who came to examine our baggage exchanged a curious meaning look with him. My fellow traveller believed that I had not observed yet keenly on the alert as I now was, I was shrewd to detect the least sign or look, and I at once resolved to tell the fellow nothing further of my own affairs. He was, no doubt, a spy of the Stranglers, who had followed me all the way from Abo, and had only entered my carriage for the final stage of the journey. This revelation caused me some uneasiness, for even though I was able to evade the man on arrival in Petersburg, he could no doubt quickly obtain news of my whereabouts from the police to whom my passport must be sent. I pretended to doze and lay back with my eyes half-closed watching him. When he found me disinclined to talk further, he took up the paper which he had bought and became engrossed in it, while I, on my part, endeavoured to form some plan by which to mislead and escape his vigilance. The fellow meant mischief, that I knew. If Elma was flying in secret and he watched me, he would know that she was in Petersburg. At all hazards, for my love's sake as well as for mine, I saw that I must escape him. The ingenious and cleverness of Oberg's spies was proverbial throughout Finland. Therefore he might not be alone, or in any case on arrival in Petersburg, would obtain assistance in keeping observation upon me. I knew that the Baron desired my death, and that therefore I could not be too wary of pitfalls. That fatal chair so cunningly prepared for me in Lambeth was still vividly within my memory. As we passed Lanskaya and ran through the outer suburbs of Petersburg, my fellow-traveller became inquisitive as to where I was going. 
but I was somewhat unresponsive and busied myself with my bag until we entered the great echoing terminus where I could see the Neva gleaming in the pale sunlight and the city beyond. The fellow made no attempt to follow me. He was too clever a secret agent for that. He merely wished me Strasvujce, raised his hat politely, and disappeared. A porter carried my bag out of the station, and I drove across the bridge to the large hotel where I had stopped before, on the corner of the Nevsky Prospect and the Michael Street. There I engaged a front room, looking down into the broad Nevsky, had a wash, and then watched at the window for the appearance of the spy. I had already a good four hours before the steamer from Abo was due, and I intended to satisfy myself whether or not I was being followed. Within twenty minutes the fellow lounged along on the opposite side of the road, just as I had expected. He had changed his clothes and presented such a different appearance that at first sight I failed to recognize him. He knew that I had driven there and intended to follow me if I came forth. My position was one of extreme difficulty, for if I went down to the quay he would most certainly follow me. Having watched his movements for ten minutes or so, I descended to the big salle à manger and there ate my luncheon, chatting to the French waiter the while. I sat purposely in an alcove so as to be away from the other people lunching there, and in order that I might be able to talk with the waiter without being overheard. Just as I had finished my meal, and he was handing me my bill, I bent towards him and asked, "'Do you want to earn twenty roubles?' "'Well, monsieur,' he answered, looking at me with some surprise, "'they would be acceptable. I am a married man.' Well, I want to escape from this place without being observed. There is a disagreeable little matter regarding a lady, and I fear a fracas with a man who is awaiting me outside in the Nevsky. Then, seeing that he hesitated, I assured him that I had committed no crime and that I should return for my baggage that evening. You could pass through the kitchen and out by the servants' entrance, he said, after a moment's reflection. If monsieur so desires, I will conduct him out. The exit is in a back street which leads on to the Catherine Canal. Excellent, I said. Let us go. Of course you will say nothing? Not a word, monsieur, and he gathered up the notes plus twenty roubles with which I paid my bill, and taking my hat I followed him to the end of the salle à manger behind a high wooden screen across the huge kitchen and then through a long stone corridor at the end of which sat a gruff old doorkeeper. My guide spoke a word to him, and then the door opened and I found myself in a narrow back slum with a canal beyond. My first visit was to a clothier's, where I purchased and put on a new light overcoat, and then to a hatter's for a hat of a different shape to that which I was wearing. I carried the hat back to a quiet alley which I had noticed, and quickly exchanged the one I was wearing for it, leaving my old hat in a corner. Then I entered a café in order to while away the hours until the vessel from Finland was due. At four o'clock I was out upon the quay, straining my eyes seaward for any signs of smoke, but could see nothing. The sun was sinking, and the broad expanse of water westward danced like liquid gold. The light died out slowly, the cold grey of evening crept on. A chill wind sprang up and swept the quay, causing me to shiver. I asked of a dock labourer whether the steamer was usually late, whereupon he told me that it was often five or six hours behind time, depending upon the delay at Helsingfors. Twilight deepened into night, and the rain fell heavily, yet I still paced the wet flags in patience, my eyes ever seaward for the light of the vessel, which I hoped bore my love. My presence there aroused some speculation among the loungers, I think. Nevertheless, I waited in deepest anxiety whether, after all, Elma and Hornby had not disembarked at Helsingfors. Soon after ten o'clock, a light shone afar off, and the movement of the police and porters on the quay told me that it was the vessel. Then, after a further anxious quarter of an hour, it came, amid great shouting and mutual imprecations, 
slowly alongside the quay, and the passengers at last began to disembark in the pelting rain. One after another they walked up the gangway, filing into the passport office and on into the custom house, people of all sorts and all grades, Swedes, Germans, Finns and Russians, until suddenly I caught sight of two figures, one a man in a big tweed travelling coat and a golf cap, and the other the slight figure of a woman in a long dark cloak and a woolen tam o' shanter. The electric rays fell upon them as they came up the wet gangway together, and there once again I saw the sweet face of the silent woman whom I had grown to love with such fervent desperation. The man behind her was the same who had entertained me on board the Lola, the man who was said to be the lover of the fugitive Muriel Leithcourt. Without betraying my presence, I watched them pass through the passport office and custom house, and then, overhearing the address which Martin Woodruff gave the Isboschik, I stood aside, wet to the skin, and saw them drive away. At eleven o'clock on the following day, I found myself installed in the Hôtel de Paris, a comfortable hostelry in the little Morskaya, having succeeded in evading the vigilance of the spy who had so cleverly followed me from Abo, and in getting my suitcase round from the Hotel Europe. I was beneath the same roof as Elma, although she was in ignorance of my presence. Anxious to communicate with her without Woodruff's knowledge, I was now awaiting my opportunity. He had, it appeared, taken for her a pleasant front room with a sitting-room adjoining on the first floor, while he himself occupied a room on the third floor. The apartments he had engaged for her were the most expensive in the hotel, and as far as I could gather from the French waiter whom I judiciously tipped, he appeared to treat her with every consideration and kindness. "'Ah, poor young lady!' the man exclaimed as he stood in my room answering my questions. "'What an affliction! She writes down all her orders, for she can utter no word.' "'Has the Englishman received any visitors?' I asked. "'One man, a Russian, an official of police, I think. "'If he receives any one else, let me know,' I said, "'and I want you to give Mademoiselle a letter from me in secret.' "'Bien, monsieur.' I turned to the little writing-table and scribbled a few hasty lines to my love, announcing my presence and asking her to grant me an interview in secret as soon as Woodruff was absent. I also warned her of the search for her instigated by the baron, and urged her to send me a line in reply. The note was delivered into her hand, but although I waited in suspense nearly all day, she sent no reply. While Woodruff was in the hotel, I dared not show myself, lest he should recognize me. Therefore I was compelled to sham indisposition, and to eat my meals alone in my room. Both the means by which she had met Martin Woodruff and the motive were equally an enigma. By that letter she had written to her schoolfellow, it was apparent that she had some secret of his, for had she not wished to send him a message of reassurance that she had divulged nothing? This would seem that they were close friends, yet on the other hand something seemed to tell me that he was acting falsely and was really an ally of the baron's. Why had he brought her to Petersburg? If he had desired to rescue her, he would have taken her in the opposite direction, to Stockholm, where she would be free, whereas he took her, an escaped prisoner, into the very midst of peril. It was true that her passport was in order, yet I remembered that an order had been issued for her transportation to Sakhalien, and now, once arrested, she must be lost to me for ever. This thought filled me with fierce anxiety. She was in Petersburg, that city where police spies swarm, and where every fresh arrival is noted and his antecedents inquired into. No attempt had been made to disguise who she was. Therefore, before long, the police would undoubtedly come and arrest her as the escaped criminal from Kayana. For several hours I sat at my window watching the life and movement down in the street below, my mind full of wonder and dark forebodings. Was Martin Woodruff playing her false? Just after half-past six o'clock, the waiter entered, and handing me a note on a salver, said, Mademoiselle has, I believe, only this moment been able to write in secret. 
I tore it open and read as follows. Dear friend, I am so surprised. I thought you were still in Abo. Woodruff has an appointment at eight o'clock on the other side of the city. Therefore, come to me at 8.15. I must see you, and at once. I am in peril. Elma Heath. My love was in peril. It was just as I had feared. I thank Providence that I had been sent to help her and extricate her from that awful fate to which the strangler of Finland had consigned her. At the hour she named, after the waiter had come to me and announced the Englishman's departure, I descended to her sitting-room and entered without rapping, for if I had rapped she could not, alas, have heard. The apartment was spacious and comfortable, thickly carpeted with heavy furniture and gilding. Before the long window were drawn curtains of dark green plush, and on one side was the high stove of white porcelain with shining brass bands, while from her low lounge chair a slim wan figure sprang up quickly and came forward to greet me, holding out both her hands and smiling happily. I took her hands in mine and held them tightly in silence for some moments, as I looked earnestly into those wonderfully brilliant eyes of hers. She turned away, laughing, a slight flush rising to her cheeks in her confusion. Then she led me to a chair and motioned me to be seated. Ours was a silent meeting, but her gestures and the expression of her eyes were surely more eloquent than mere words. I knew well what pleasure that re-encounter caused her, equal pleasure with that it gave me. Until that moment I had never really loved. I had admired and flirted with women. What man has not? Indeed, I had admired Muriel Leithcourt. But never until now had I experienced in my heart the real flame of true burning affection. The sweetness of her expression, the tender caress of those soft, tapering hands, the deep, mysterious look in those magnificent eyes, and the incomparable grace of all her movements, combined to render her the most perfect woman I had ever met, perfect in all, alas, save speech and hearing, of which, with such dastard wantonness, she had been deprived. She touched her red lips with the tip of her forefinger, opened her hands and shrugged her shoulders with a sad gesture of regret. Then turning quickly to some paper on the little table at her side, she wrote something with a gold pencil and handed it to me. It read, Surely Providence has sent you here. Mr. Woodruff must have followed you from England. He is my enemy. You must take me from here and hide me. They intend to send me into exile. Have you ever been in Petersburg before? Do you know anyone here? Then, when I had read, she handed me her pencil, and below I wrote, I will do my best, dear friend. I have been once in Petersburg, but is it not best that we should escape at once from Russia? Impossible at present, she wrote. We should both be arrested at the frontier. It would be best to go into hiding here in Petersburg. I believed Woodruff to be my friend, but I have found only this day that he is my enemy. He knew that I was in Kayana and was in Abo when he learned of my escape. He went with two other men in search of us and discovered us that night when we sought shelter at the woodcutter's hut. Without making his presence known, he waited outside until you were asleep, and then he came and looked in at my window. At first I was alarmed, but quickly I saw that he was a friend. He told me that the police were in the vicinity and intended to raid the hut. Therefore I fled with him, first down to Tamerforce, and then to Abo, and on here. At that time I did not see the dastardly trap he had laid in order to get me out of the baron's clutches and wring from me my secret. If I confess, he intends to give me up to the police, who will send me to the mines." "'Does your secret concern him?' I asked in writing. "'Yes,' she wrote in response. "'It would be equally in his interest as well as those of Baron Oberg "'if I were sent to Sagalien and my identity effaced. "'I am a Russian subject, as I have already told you. "'Therefore, with the ministerial order against me, "'I am in deadliest peril.' "'Trust in me,' I scribbled quickly. "'I will act upon any suggestion you make.' 
have you any female friend in whom you could trust to hide you until this danger is past there is one friend a true friend will you take a note to her she wrote to which i instantly nodded in the affirmative then rising she obtained some ink and pen and wrote a letter the contents of which she did not show me before she sealed it i sat watching her beautiful head bent beneath the shaded lamplight catching her profile and noticing how eminently handsome it was superb and unblemished in her youthful womanhood i watched her write the superscription upon the envelope madame olga stasulevich modiste skredny prospect two thirty one vasily ostrov i knew that the district was on the opposite side of the city close to the little neva take a drosky at once see her and await a reply in the meantime i will prepare to be ready when you return she wrote if olga is not at home ask to see the red priest in russian krasny pastor return quickly as i fear woodruff may come back if so i am lost i assured her i would not lose a single instant and five minutes later i was tearing down the morskaya in a drosky along the canal and across the nicholas bridge to the address upon the envelope the house was i found somewhat smaller than its neighbours but not let out in flats as the others upon the door was a large brass plate bearing the name olga stasulevich modes i pressed the electric button and in answer a tall clean-shaven russian servant opened the door madame is not at home was his brief reply to my inquiry then i will see the red priest i said in a lower tone i come from elma heath thereupon without further word the man admitted me into the long dark hall and closed the door with an apology that the gas was not lighted but striking a match he led me up the broad staircase and into a small cosy well furnished room on the second floor evidently the sitting-room of some studious person judging from the books and critical reviews lying about for a few minutes i waited there until the door reopened and there entered a man of medium height with a shock of long snow-white hair and an almost patriarchal beard whose dark eyes that age had dimmed flashed out at me with a look of curious inquiry and whose movements were those of a person not quite at his ease i have called on behalf of mademoiselle elma heath to give this letter to madame stasulevich or if she is absent to place it in the hands of the red priest i explained in my best russian very well sir the old man responded in quite good english i am the person you seek and taking the letter he opened and read it through i saw by the expression on his furrowed face that its contents caused him the utmost consternation his countenance already pale blanched to the lips while in his eyes there shot a fire of quick apprehension the thin almost transparent hand holding the letter trembled visibly you know mademoiselle eh he asked in a hoarse strained voice as he turned to me you will help her to escape i will risk my own life in order to save hers i declared and your devotion to her is prompted by what he inquired suspiciously i was silent for a moment then i confessed the truth my affection ah he sighed deeply poor young lady she who has enemies on every hand sadly needs a friend but can we trust you have you no fear of what of being implicated in the coming revolution in russia remember i am the red priest have you never heard of me my name is otto kampf otto kampf i stood before him open-mouthed who in russia had not heard of that mysterious unknown person who had directed a hundred conspiracies against the imperial autocrat and yet the identity of whom the police had always failed to discover it was believed that kampf had once been professor of chemistry at moscow university and that he had invented the most terrible and destructive explosive used by the revolutionists the ingredients of the powerful compound and the mode of firing it was the secret of the nihilists alone 
and otto kampf the mysterious leader whose personality was unknown even to the conspirators themselves directed those constant attempts which held the emperor and his government in such hourly terror rewards without number had been offered by the ministry of the interior for the betrayal and arrest of the unseen man whose power in russia permeating every class was greater than that of the emperor himself at whose word one day the people would rise in a body and destroy their oppressors the emperor the ministers the police and the bureaucrats knew this yet they were powerless they knew that the mysterious professor who had disappeared from moscow fifteen years before and had never since been seen was only waiting his opportunity to strike a blow that would stagger and crush the empire from end to end yet of his whereabouts they were in utter ignorance you are surprised the old man laughed noticing my amazement well you are not one of us yet i need not impress upon you the absolute necessity for mademoiselle's sake to preserve the secret of my existence it is because you are not a member of the will of the people that you have never heard of the red priest red because i wrote my ultimatum to the czar in the blood of one of his victims knouted in the fortress of peter and paul and priest because i preached the gospel of freedom and justice i shall say nothing i said gazing at the strangely striking figure before me the unknown man who directed the great upheaval that was to revolutionize russia my only desire is to save mademoiselle heath and you are prepared to do so at risk of your own liberty your own life ah you said you love her would not this be a test of your affection i am prepared for any test as long as she escapes the trap which her enemies have set for her i succeeded in saving her from kayana and i intend to save her now was it you who actually entered kayana and snatched her from that tomb he exclaimed and he took my hand enthusiastically adding i have no further need to doubt you and turning to the table he wrote an address upon a slip of paper saying take mademoiselle there she will find a safe place of concealment but go quickly for every moment places you both in more deadly peril hide yourself there also i thanked him and left at once but as i stepped out of the house and re-entered the drosky i saw close by lurking in the shadow the spy of the strangler of finland who had travelled with me from abo our eyes met and he recognized me notwithstanding my light overcoat and new hat then with heart sinking the ghastly truth flashed upon me all had been in vain elma was lost to me end of chapter thirteen Chapter Fourteen of the Czar's Spy by William Lecoeur. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Her Highness is inquisitive. Instantly the danger was apparent, and instead of driving back to the hotel, I called out to the man to take me to the Moscow railway station in order to put the spy off the scent. I knew he would follow me, but as he was on foot with no drosky in sight i should be able to reach the station before he could and therefore elude him over the stones we rattled leaving the lurking agent standing in the deep shadow but on turning back i saw him dash across a road to a by-street where in all probability he had a conveyance in waiting then after we had crossed the neva i countermanded my order to the man saying don't go right up to the station turn into the Litanoi Prospect to the left, and put me down there. Drive quickly, and I'll pay double fare. He whipped his horses, and we turned into that maze of dark, ill-lit, narrow streets that lies between the Vosnesensky and the Nevsky, turning and winding until we emerged at last into the main thoroughfare again. And then at last we turned into the street I had indicated, 
a wide road of handsome buildings where i knew i was certain to be able to instantly get another drosky i flung the man his money alighted and two minutes later was driving on towards the alexander bridge travelling in a circle back to the hotel time after time i glanced behind but saw nothing of the baron spy who had evidently gone to the station with all speed expecting that i was leaving the capital i found elma in her room ready dressed to go out wearing a long travelling cloak and in her hand was a small dressing-case she was pale and full of anxiety until i showed her the slip of paper which otto kampf had given me with the address written upon it and then together we hurried forth the house to which we drove was we discovered a large one facing the fontanka canal one of the best quarters of the town and on descending i asked a liveried dvornik from madame zurloff the name which the red priest had written you mean the princess zurloff remarked the man through his red beard whom shall i say desires to see her take that i said handing to him the piece of paper which beside the address bore a curious cipher mark like three triangles joined he closed the door leaving us in the wide carpeted hall the statuary in which showed us that it was a richly furnished place and when a few minutes later he returned he conducted us upstairs to a fine gilded salon where an elderly grey-haired lady in black stood gravely to receive us allow me to present mademoiselle elma heath princess i said speaking in french and bowing and afterwards telling her my own name our hostess welcomed my love in a graceful speech but i said mademoiselle unfortunately suffers a terrible affliction she is deaf and dumb ah how very very sad she exclaimed sympathetically poor girl poor girl and she placed her hand tenderly upon elma's shoulder and looked into her eyes then turning to me she said so the red priest has sent you both to me you are in danger of arrest i suppose you wish me to conceal you here i would only ask sanctuary for mademoiselle was my reply for myself i have no fear i am english and therefore not a member of the party the mademoiselle fears arrest there is an order signed for her banishment to sakalyan i said she was imprisoned at kayana the fortress away in finland but i succeeded in liberating her she has actually been in kayana gasped the princess ah we have all heard sufficient of the horrors of that place and you liberated her why she is the only person who has ever escaped from that living tomb to which oberg sends his victims i believe so princess and may i take it monsieur that the reason you risked your life for her is because you love her pardon me for suggesting this then knowing that elma could not hear i added i love her but we are not lovers i have not told her of my affection hers is a long and strange story and she will perhaps tell you something of it in writing well exclaimed the grey-haired lady smiling leading my love across the luxurious room the atmosphere of which was filled with the scent of flowers and taking off her cloak with her own hands you are safe here my poor child if spies have not followed you then you shall remain my guest as long as you desire i am sure it is very good of you princess i said gratefully miss heath is the victim of a vile and dastardly conspiracy when i tell you that she has been afflicted as she is by her enemies that an operation was performed upon her in italy while she was unconscious you will readily see in what deadly peril she is what she cried have her enemies actually done this horrible she will perhaps tell you of the strange romance that surrounds her a mystery which i have not yet been able to fathom she is a russian subject although she has been educated in england baron oberg himself is i believe her worst and most bitter enemy ah the strangler she exclaimed with a quick flash in her dark eyes but his end is near the movement is active in helsingfors at any moment now we may strike our blow for freedom 
She was an enthusiastic revolutionist, I could see, unsuspected, however, by the police on account of her high position in Petersburg society. It was she who, as I afterwards discovered, had furnished the large sums of money to Kampf for the continuation of the revolutionary propaganda, and indeed secretly devoted the greater part of her revenues from her vast estates in Samara and Kazan to the nihilist cause. Her husband, himself an enthusiast of freedom, although of the high nobility, had been killed by a fall from his horse six years before, and since that time she had retired from society and lived there quietly, making the revolutionary movement her sole occupation. The authorities believed that her retirement was due to the painful loss she had sustained, and had no suspicion that it was her money that enabled the mysterious red priest to slowly but surely complete the plot for the general uprising. She compelled me to remove my coat, and tea was served by a Tartar footman, whose family, she explained, had been serfs of the Zurlofs for three centuries, and then Elma exchanged confidences with her by means of paper and pencil. "'Who is this man Martin Woodruff, of whom she speaks?' asked the princess presently, turning to me. "'I have met him twice, only twice,' I replied, and under strange circumstances. Then continuing, I told her something concerning the incidents of the yacht Lola. "'He may be in love with her, and desires to force her into marriage,' she suggested, expressing amazement at the curious narrative I had related. "'I think not, for several reasons. One is because I know she holds some secret concerning him, and another because he is engaged to an English girl named Muriel Leithcourt. Leithcourt? Leithcourt? repeated the princess, knitting her brows with a puzzled air. Do you happen to know her father's name? Philip Leithcourt. And has he actually been living in Scotland? Yes, I answered in quick anxiety. He rented a chute called Rannoch, near Dumfries. A mysterious incident occurred on his estate. A double murder, or murder and suicide, which is not quite clear. But shortly afterwards there appeared one evening at the house a man named Chater, Hilton Chater, and the whole family at once fled and disappeared. Princess Zurloff sat with her lips pressed close together, looking straight at the silent girl before her. Elma had removed her hat and cloak, and now sat in a deep easy chair of yellow silk, with the lamplight shining on her chestnut hair, settled and calm as though already thoroughly at home. I smiled to myself as I thought of the chagrin of Woodruff when he returned to find his victim missing. Uh, "'Your Highness evidently knows the Leithcourts,' I hazarded after a brief silence. "'I have heard of them,' was her unsatisfactory reply. "'I go to England sometimes. When the Prince was alive we were often at Claridge's for the season. The Prince was for five years military attaché at the embassy under de Stahl, you know. What I know of the Leith courts is not to their credit. But you tell me that there was a mysterious incident before their flight. Explain it to me. At that moment the long white doors of the handsome salon were thrown open by the faithful Tartar servitor, and there entered a man whose hair fell over the collar of his heavy overcoat, but whom, in an instant, I recognized as Otto Kampf. Both Elma and I sprang to our feet, while advancing to the princess, he bent and gallantly kissed the hand she held forth to him. Then he shook hands with Elma, and acknowledging my own greetings, took off his coat and threw it upon a chair, with the air of an accustomed visitor. "'I come, princess, in order to explain to you,' he said. "'Mademoiselle fears rearrest, and the only house in Petersburg that the police never suspect is this.' Therefore I send her to you, knowing that with your generosity you will help her in her distress. It is all arranged, was Her Highness's response. She will remain here, poor girl, until it is safe for her to get out of Russia. Then, after some further conversation, and after my well-beloved had made signs of heartfelt gratitude to the man known from end to end of the Russian Empire as the Red Priest, the Princess turned to me, saying, 
I would much like to know what occurred before the Leithcourts left Scotland. The Leithcourts? exclaimed Kampf in utter surprise. Do you know the Leithcourts? And the English officer at Durnford? I looked into his eyes in abject amazement. What connection could Jack Durnford, of the Marines, have with the adventurer Philip Leithcourt? I, however, recollected Jack's word when I had described the visit of the Lola to Leghorn, and further I recollected that very shortly he would be back in London from his term of Mediterranean service. Well, I said after a pause, I happen to know Captain Durford very well, but I had no idea that he was friendly with Leithcourt. The Red Priest smiled, stroking his white beard. Explain to Her Highness what she desires to know, and I will tell you. My eyes met Elma's, and I saw how intensely eager and interested she was, watching the movement of my lips, and trying to make out what words I uttered. Well, I said, a mysterious tragedy occurred on the edge of a wood near the house rented by Leithcourt, a tragedy which has puzzled the police to this day. An Italian named Santini and his wife were found murdered. Santini, gasped Kampf, starting up, but surely he is not dead? No, that's the curious part of the affair. The man who was killed was a man disguised to represent the Italian, while the woman was actually the waiter's wife herself. I happen to know the man Santini well, for both he and his wife were for some years in my employ the princess and the director of the Russian revolutionary movement exchanged quick glances. It was as though Her Highness implored Kampf to reveal to me the truth, while he, on his part, was averse to doing so. "'And upon whom does suspicion rest?' asked Her Highness. "'As far as I can make out, the police have no clue whatever, except one. At the spot was found a tiny miniature cross of one of the Russian orders of chivalry, the cross of St. Anne. There is no suspicion upon Leithcourt, she asked, with some undue anxiety, I thought. No. Did he entertain any guests at the shooting box? A good many. No foreigners among them? I never met any. They seemed all people from London, a smart set for the most part. Then why did the Leithcourts disappear so suddenly? "'Because of the appearance of the man Chater, I replied. "'It is evident that they feared him, "'for they took every precaution against being followed. "'In fact, they fled, leaving a big party of friends in the house. "'The man Woodruff, now at the Hôtel de Paris, "'is a friend of Leithcourt as well as of Chater. "'He was not a guest of Leithcourt "'when this man representing Santini was assassinated?' "'asked Kampf, again stroking his beard. "'No.' As soon as Woodruff recognized me as a visitor, he left for Hamburg. He was afraid to face you because of the ransacking of the British consul's safe at Leghorn, remarked the princess, who at the same moment took Elma's hand tenderly in her own and looked at her. Then, turning to me, she said, What you have told us tonight, Mr. Gregg, throws a new light upon certain incidents that had hitherto puzzled us. The mystery of it all is a great and inscrutable one, the mystery of this poor, unfortunate girl, greatest of all. But both of us will endeavour to help you elucidate it. We will help poor Elma to crush her enemies, these cowardly villains who had maimed her. Ah, princess, I cried, if you will only help and protect her, you will be doing an act of mercy to a defenceless woman. I love her, I admit it. I have done my utmost, I have striven to solve the dark mystery, but up to the present I have been unsuccessful and have only remained, even till today, the victim of circumstance. Let her stay with me, the kindly woman answered, smiling tenderly upon my love. She will be safe here, and in the meantime we will endeavour to discover the real and actual truth. And in response I took the princess's hand and pressed it fervently. Although that striking white-headed man and the rather stiff formal woman in black were the leaders of the great and all-powerful movement in Russia known throughout the civilized world as the Terror, yet they were nevertheless our friends. They had pledged themselves to help us thwart our enemies. 
I scribbled a few hasty words upon paper and handed it to Elma. And for answer she smiled contentedly, looking into my eyes with an expression of trust, devotion, and love. End of chapter 14